do you know that God can make all grace, the Amplified says sufficiency, all grace and sufficiency abound toward you so that you always having sufficiency. Say it, sufficiency. Sufficiency. So you can always have sufficiency abound to every good work. Uh, God makes all grace and sufficiency abound toward you so that you always having all sufficiency in all things that you may abound to every good work and charitable donations. Giving is part of our faith. God so loved that he gave to us and we reciprocate by giving his love, his goodness, his mercy, his grace, his kindness, his favor to others. We bless the Lord today. Thank you, Father. We're grateful for your presence, your goodness, and your manifestation. We say these things in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, Amen. 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 Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, excellent musicians and singers. Wonderful worship and praise. And now we get to have the Word of God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brian Gowan, for holding the fort on Wednesday night while we were at the funeral and had a chance to share the, uh, just share the simple gospel with the people there. And our prayer is that people, we know where our sister went. Our sister went to heaven. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, there's no time. There's just instantaneous. You don't have to travel. You don't have to wait. You don't have to go to a place called in between or limbo. No, man, you just go straight to the presence of the Lord. And our, our sister went home to be with the Lord, and we're just grateful to have been a part of it and to share. So thank God. It's good to be back. So um, we're starting a new series or at least a new message today. Hey, before we do, uh, uh, God is able to make all grace abound toward you so that you, say me, me. so that I always have sufficiency in all things that I may abound to every good work and charitable nation. God is able to make all grace and abound toward me. Thank God for the grace that abounds towards me. I'm talking about us, to, talking about you. Grace is abounding to you if you'll believe it. Faith receives the word of God. And when we choose to believe it and we choose to receive it and we choose to act on it, the word of God comes alive in our lives and we walk by faith and not by sight. Hallelujah. All right, so does anybody know what time it is? Someone says state fair time. No, that's not, that's not significant. Does anybody know what time it is? Somebody says it's back to school time. No, we don't want to talk about school. We all went there, and uh, I'm some of you. <laughs> but uh, the time right now, what time is it? It is Bible festival time. Bible <laughs> festival time. We have, we have clappers in the house. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of praise. Hosanna, Hosanna. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's Bible festival time. Amen. Praise God. So in, our, in the full gospel, we cover the whole range, the broad range, and cover ground of, of different topics. And because of within a couple days we'll be in the month of September and we want to get out ahead of it to, to get people thinking about some of these things and the festivals are signs that point to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Bible festivals are Old Testament Jewish celebrations that God instructed the children of Israel to keep celebrating forever. So when you think about forever, as a Christian, when I enter glory, somehow, some way, the continuing celebration of all these festivals will continue simply based on their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. 
These festivals are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, we are the church of Jesus Christ, and so we pay attention to the festivals. And, and there are several reasons why we do pay attention to the festivals. Father, I thank you for the festivals. I thank you for the word. I thank you for the month of September. I thank you for the fair and school and all these wonderful things that are happening. But I thank you most of all for your word and for your festivals, because in them we learn more about Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we know that the spring festivals were all fulfilled already in Jesus Christ. The Bible says the Apostle Paul said, Christ is our Passover. He was sacrificed for us. And then, of course, he is uh, our unleavened bread. He is the, the bread of life. He is the, the bread without any yeast in it. And he's the unleavened bread uh, of life. And then, of course, he rose again on that uh, first day of the week, the day called first fruits. And so Christ is our first fruits from the dead. He is our unleavened bread. He's the bread of life. And he is the Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us. So we know that those festivals were fulfilled in Christ, but the fall festivals have yet to be fulfilled. And so as a Christian, a well-rounded Christian, or we can say a full gospel Christian. I am a full gospel Christian because I receive the things of the Old Testament. I receive the things of Proverbs and Psalms and uh, the, the prophets, and I, but I'm, I focus mainly on the gospels of the New Testament and then the writings of the Apostle Paul and then the smaller books in the end and, of course, the book of Revelation. So we are students of the Bible. We are people of the Bible. We are a church of the Bible. We want to be a church of the Bible. We encourage every person in here and every person watching. By the way, welcome to our service this morning. God bless you for joining us and signing on. And uh, we want to be people of the Word, uh, Word Church, Word People, Word Based, because the 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 significance or or let me just say, being a solid Christian. You can't be a solid Christian if you're not a solid word person. I know there's some really solid, good people that we know. I mean, there's a lot of Christians that were, were raised right or they were, they were strong in their, their convictions and their, they, they are, are good moral people. But when you are a, a word person then you are developing your faith. You're a person of faith and you grow in strength and you grow in your knowledge of the Lord and you become the kind of person that God can use and you just expand from there. We expand into God using us to speak or to, to share or to, to encourage someone, the gift of encouragement or the gift of faith or the uh, gift of all these things that, that you need to be a, a well-rounded Christian. We believe in being well-rounded Christians. Amen. All right, so going forward today, as we, uh, as we look at, uh, as we realize that the, the spring festivals were, were fulfilled, we're looking forward in the month of uh, September as at the fall festivals, and it's pretty simple mathematics that if Jesus fulfilled those festivals in himself, that they, the festivals point to Christ, I know that if you tell a uh, Jewish person that you know that that believes in in all uh, their their Old Testament, then they don't acknowledge that. But we acknowledge that our Lord and Savior fulfilled those those uh, early festivals, and now we're looking for the fulfillment of the fall festivals that are coming. So we're looking at uh, we're looking at these fall festivals, and uh, we believe that the fulfillment of them is is included in our end time scenario. And so for some of you that don't like the subject of end times, hey, for a lot of us, it's an exciting thing to contemplate that, you know, we, uh, I got past the fear. I got past the fear of that scripture that says, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet, do, 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 the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ. Hey, yeah, that's bizarre. But the dead in Christ shall rise first. It'll happen in a split second. You won't have a time to see it. You won't have time to evaluate it. You won't have time to think about it because the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, 
we shall be changed. And once you're changed, and this mortal puts on immortality, when you put on immortality, your brain is changed too. And you don't think like you think now. You'll think eternal thoughts. You'll have wisdom. You'll have understanding. You'll have full capability that God has. He'll deposit you in the instant, in the twinkling of an eye. As your body is changed, so will your mind, so will everything about you. And at that point, there's no fear anymore. Fear is of this earth. And we don't, when we leave this earth, we're leaving fear goodbye. Hallelujah. 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 I know somebody, you know, some of you guys, I'm looking at some of you men, and you're going, oh, I don't have no fear. Ah, I'm, uh, I'm uh, you know, fearless. Yeah, I like to say that too. I could tell you instances in my life where I tried to prove my fearlessness, but I won't waste your time. The guys would like it, but the girls probably wouldn't. So I'm just, you know. Um, the point being is that these things are in the twinkling of an eye when Jesus comes. And we'll look at the scripture in a moment that, uh, that will, we'll, uh, this end time scenario. And when we say end time, uh, please don't, don't you know, let's, let's get past the idea of, you know, there are many Christians, some of you watching, hopefully you didn't shut me off when I said end time stuff. It just means that there's a conclusion. We know that the book of Revelation, you know, I had, I had a chance to mention on Wednesday night at the funeral that, that uh, you know, in, in the book of Matthew, over 40 times it talks about heaven. And in the book of Revelation, in the conclusion of the Bible, it talks about heaven over 30 times. And so between those two books, Matthew and Revelation, it talks about heaven over 70 times. And so I just, you know, reiterate to you, anyone here that is struggling, heaven's real. It's more real. The spiritual realm created the natural realm. That one really threw me for a loop when I first heard that, that the spiritual realm created the natural realm. You and I think the natural's real, but the spiritual is kind of iffy. But the spiritual realm is the solid, and the natural realm is the shaky. And so the whole shaking aspect that God says, one more time I will shake things. But praise God, when a person departs this earth in the twinkling of an eye, the body is changed and the spirit rises up and they, they go to meet the Lord in heaven and they're forever and ever with them. And then, of course, in, we're, the Bible says we're not all going to die, that some of us are going to be alive when Jesus Christ comes back. The Lord shall descend from heaven. I, I said, I'll say it again. With this, uh, the Lord shall descend, descend from heaven with a shout, with the uh, voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And from that point on, we'll always be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. So, so there's a lot of, uh, I, I say these things on purpose for young Christians or, or new Christians that uh, haven't received yet a full picture, but the, the comfort that we have that uh, all of this, which is to some, maybe you've overcome challenges, all of your challenges, and you become a great warrior in this realm of the earth. And so your confidence is up on a high level right now. But if you really faced uh, uh, principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness and high places, if you, if you dealt with those things on a consistent basis, it would shake you to your core because uh, there is they are supernatural beings. And so we're not talking about being afraid because uh, in Christ there's no fear. But we just want you to know that, again, we wrestle not with those things, but we stand in the word of God. And it's the word of God that makes us strong. We're strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We're strong in knowing scripture. We use the scripture as the sword of the spirit each and every time that the enemy wants to come against you. We use scripture to fight back. If I try and fight back, if I try and stand my ground. If I try and just be stoic, uh, it's not going to do really much. Uh, much. I mean, some, some people are stronger than others. I know, I know that there are a lot of ladies in this room are super really strong. They're really, really strong in their, in their, in their abilities and everything like that. But, but to be spiritually strong, 
to be strengthened with might by God's spirit in my inside, in my inner man, in my spirit, is the way to be supernaturally strong. And therefore, you can stand against the wiles of the enemy. You can stand against the things of this, 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 the, the earth that we're going to leave behind at some point. It's all going to... Uh, <laughs> we know what the back of the book says. We know what the back of the book says. So we know that there is a time coming. And so what I want to do is I don't want to make anyone afraid. I want to make someone aware of the time. The Bible talks about times and seasons. The Apostle Paul said, there's no need for me to write to you about times and seasons. And then he goes, for you well know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord will come. It's just a reality of Christianity. If you accept Christianity, there, there are many, many religions that say they're Christians, but they don't believe in the Lord coming back. They believe that this is the kingdom of God on heaven right now, and they're just going to go right into it. And, but, but the Bible talks clearly about uh, the, the, the Lord will descend from heaven. He'll come back for the church, and he'll remove the church according to what the scripture says, what the apostle Paul says, and then there will be a period on earth that is fulfilled in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Revelation talks about that time. And you know, and I know, we've talked about it many times, that the apostle John was given uh, the letters to the church from the Lord Jesus Christ in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. And then in, in the verse, first verse of chapter four, a door opened in heaven and a voice said, come up here. And from that point on, the church is never mentioned again. Now, right now, the most important thing there is to God is the church. Why? Because the church is the body of Christ, and it's the most important thing there is on earth to Almighty God. I know that some people say, well, Israel or, or the, all these other things, uh, but the church is the, the bride of Christ, and therefore, this is the most important thing there is. But when a door opens in Revelation chapter 4, and a voice has come up here, and the church is gathered in the instant, in a twinkling of an eye, and the church is removed up to heaven, and then we know that the rest of the book of Revelation begins to unfold, and you know what those seven years entail. If you've read it, if you've heard it, if you've studied it, if you've listened to anything, if you watched the movies about the rapture or if you watched the movies about Revelation, you know there's some hell on earth ahead. Well, just don't worry about hell on earth by getting saved. Be saved. If you're out there, be saved. We don't know if someone's watching who's not saved. We don't know if someone in this room has never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. But the moment you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to do a bunch of good works to be a Christian. You don't have to do a bunch of good works to become a part of the church. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you are accepted in the Beloved. You are accepted the Beloved is Christ. You're accepted into the family of God. You're part of the church. You might, you go, well, I didn't do anything good yet. Uh, it's not about you doing good. It's about him doing good. It's about his favor, his grace, his mercy, his sacrifice, everything that he did to pay so that you could be worthy in God's eyes. I know myself, if you, you know, I'm, you know maybe I yell when I'm driving or, or I get mad at my wife or, or, you know, sometimes I bark at the dog. No, but sometimes, you know, barking at the dog is just, you know, whatever. But, but the point being is that, you know, uh, we're saved by grace through faith, not of myself, not of works. It's a gift from God. I was raised not knowing that. And so I was trying to be good. I'm good pastors, good Baptist people. But when I came in to Word of Faith, they taught me the Word of God more, the full gospel. They believe all the good things that are in the Bible for you and I through faith in Jesus Christ. And so I want you, I want us to, to open ourselves to expand and to believe that scripture that you didn't believe. There was, there's some, everyone has a scripture, they just go, oh, it just can't be true. But all of a sudden you just say, I'm going to believe it by faith and receive it by faith. And so we're believing that there is a, uh, there, you know, the truth of the matter, I heard, just heard this, so I'm going to say this. 
There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And the thought comes to mind that people, someone believes in heaven, but they don't believe in hell. They don't believe that a good God would send anyone to hell. But Jesus said so. In, I mean, the most, uh, the most graphic uh, uh, example is in Luke chapter 16 with Lazarus and the rich man. And Jesus described it in so, such detail that you can't deny it. You'd either say Jesus is lying, Jesus is hallucinating, Jesus is not telling the truth, or you'll accept him as who he is. He's God, and God is telling you about the realm of the damned inside of the earth, which is the place of torment. And there's a compartment. There used to be a compartment. We've said it many times that the Old Testament saints went to Abraham's bosom. And in the, in the place called hell, there was two compartments. One was torment. One was Abraham's bosom. The righteous went to Abraham's bosom. The, the unrighteous went to uh, the place called torment. And across between the two, there was a great gulf fixed. Now, I know I said this probably the last time we were here or even a couple weeks ago, whenever it was, but the idea here is that there are many Christians that are picking and choosing what they believe, and it makes you weak in faith when you pick and choose what you want to believe. We want to believe the full gospel. We want to believe Alpha to Omega, the Genesis to Revelation. We want to re believe what the Word of God says. It's hard in some places to believe some of that. Some of the Old Testament stuff, I admit it's hard to, to receive that. And I admit sometimes I skip some of it and I go to the good parts and I refresh myself. I refresh myself a lot in the good parts. And so I'm encouraging someone today that if you've been studying the hard parts of the Bible, you need to refresh yourself in the good parts of Scripture. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. You need to encourage yourself in the, the, the blessings and the favor. I love to talk about blessings and favor. I like to talk about abundance and all that. I like to talk about healing. I like to talk about deliverance. I like to talk about victory. I like to talk about prospering. I like to talk about being in health even as my soul prospers. The Bible says that we are to be in health even as your soul. The Apostle John said it. Uh, Beloved, I wish wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And so as that scripture uh, opens the door for me to be able to prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers, my soul prospers, my body prospers in health, and my, my life comes out of debt, my life comes out of, of c continual lack, my life comes out of never, never having sufficiency or never having, uh, ever having abundance. But no, in the ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians, 8 and 9 of Corinthians, it talks about uh, all the blessings that come on, can come on you in that area of life if you study and if you be a doer of the word and you'll follow the pattern of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, then you'll be blessed too. God is able to, the scripture, I didn't even know they connected, but the, the scripture I said up front was God is able to make all grace and sufficiency. Everybody believes God is able to make all grace, but do you believe the rest of the verse that says God is able to make all grace and sufficiency abound toward you so that you always have sufficiency in all things and you can abound to good works? What does that mean? I got enough to be a blessing. I got enough to help someone. I got enough to, to give an offering. I got enough to, to, you know, hey, that life can be good. Hallelujah. Not continually dragging through the muck and mire of life, struggle, struggle, struggle. We just thank God for 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. All right, going back to the subject of the signs of the times. Uh, signs of the times was a term used by Jesus to identify important things. In Matthew 16, 3, he scolds the leaders and the people of his day for, he says, you can discern the face of the sky, you can figure out the weather, but, how, but you can't discern the signs of the times, and why can't you figure this out? They couldn't figure out that Jesus Christ because of who he said he was and what he did to prove it, that he was in the midst of them. And so he said, he scolded them, and he said, you can't discern the signs of the times. So we meet once a month in this ministry, 
on a Saturday morning at 9, and we talk about end-time events. And uh, if someone doesn't like end-time events, that terminology, then we talk about revelation. And if you don't like that either, then just, you know, it's prophecy. How about that? It's prophecy. We talk about that on a consistent basis. And we've been doing it for 11 years, once a month on Saturday at 9 a.m. in this church uh, for 11 years now. We've been talking about revelation class we call it because it's about end times and it's open to discussion it's open to debate it's open to consider uh, your your doctrine your opinion what you think versus what the bible says about these things because we find out when we talk from people that they have different opinions of what the bible says and my my opinion my opinion for if you have an opinion that contradicts the scripture Let God be true and every man a liar. You call me a liar? Man, I remember that back in that day, you know. You call me a liar, you know. No, bro, I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just saying you're not right. Let let God be right. Let God be true. Let God's word be the settling matter. Let God's word settle the matter. And wisdom says it in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. This is the conclusion of the matter. Let wisdom be the conclusion of the matter and uh, uh, the beginning of wisdom, fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the holy is understanding. And so when I get to that point, someone goes, well, I'm, I've been a good Christian all my life. Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you walk in the fear of the Lord? Knowledge of the holy is understanding. So as we grow in these things, it, it matters as it helps our doctrine to come together to match what is written in the Bible and not what they're teaching out there where somebody doesn't like the Bible or they contradict the Bible or they're preaching against the Bible or they're just plain hellions or whatever they are and they're just lying. We want to be people of the Word. Somebody say amen. 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 All right, so... All right, so no one knows the day or the hour. Uh, Matthew 25, 13. Therefore, keep watch, Jesus speaking here, it's in red, because you do not know the day or the hour, but you and I can know the times and the seasons. Some would say times and seasons. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write on to you. Write right unto you, because Paul goes on to begin to explain about times and seasons, and in that context, then there is explanations of end time things, and so we see that right now coming up in uh, the, the Jewish religion, which is the Old Testament, that they will be celebrating these different festivals. And so as a Christian in the New Testament, I still look at the festivals because the festivals help me to understand some things about uh, when Jesus Christ is coming back. And so as we look at these festivals, this group or nation chosen by God, they chose the Jews because they would protect and keep God's word and thank God that they have been diligent to protect and keep God's word, the word that they know, the Old Testament scriptures, and the, the They've been, they've been faithful to uh, keep God's word in the Old Testament, but Jesus Christ came, he fulfilled it, and now we are New Testament believers, and we are looking forward to these festivals simply because we're watching. Jesus said, watch and pray that you not, uh, fall, don't fall into temptation. But watching is a key phrase from all over the New Testament. And so I'm watching these festivals because I have a sense that when, and this is me personally, and I, and I think when you, when mon- many of you agree that if the festival uh, of Rosh Hashanah, which is coming up in, in, a, in a few weeks. Rosh Hashanah is the Feast of Trumpets. And why would I pay attention to the Feast of Trumpets? Because the New Testament says that the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together. So there is a trumpet sound. And so the Feast of Trumpets, it's, it, it, it just seems to me that there's some connection there. And Jesus said, you don't know the day or the hour of my return. But he fulfilled the Old Testament festivals of uh, unleavened bread, of uh, 
uh, uh, first fruits uh, rising on Sunday and Passover. He fulfilled those festivals. And so there's some festivals that are here coming up in the fall that have not been fulfilled yet, but they're fulfilled in Christ. In, in, in Christ. And so, again, we watch these festivals of Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets. And I suggest, could it be possibly the rapture or the catching away of the church on the Feast of Trumpets? Why would God use an Old Testament? Because he's fulfilling these prophecies and what is written about him. So the Bible says, the Apostle Paul said, that we should keep the feasts in sincerity and truth, 1 Corinthians 5.8. We keep the feast by preaching, believing in Jesus Christ, and respect for God's holy days. These are called holy days or holidays. Holy days or holidays. And so these holidays of, that are coming up, we just watch them and we're sensitive to them and we want everybody to understand them. You can blow them off after if you go, I just don't agree with watching uh, Jewish festivals uh, when I'm a New Testament Christian, but you need to know the specificity that the Bible defines about it and understand that Jesus Christ fulfilled the spring festivals so the fall festivals might possibly be fulfilled in Jesus Christ on Rosh Hashanah. So that's why I like personally to talk about festivals because we've got about three weeks, two, three weeks to prepare ourselves if you haven't been prepared. Somebody goes, well, I'm not ready to go. I've got, you know, I, I just bought fishing equipment or I just bought uh, a car or I just bought a new home or I just bought, uh, I got the season tickets to the Vikings now and I want to see at least a season's worth the Vikings games before uh, Jesus comes back because I don't know if they play football in heaven. <laughs> Do they play football in heaven? I don't know. Do they play football in heaven? I'm sure there's something, something going on up there that would be cool. I think we'd be hopping from planet to planet. It's, Hop, skip, and a jump, planet to planet, uh, uh, all over the universe, star to star. I mean, hey, you know, you can't limit yourself that, that we're going to be forever in, uh, in the new Jerusalem. Hey, be faith. Hey, Christians, hey, if I didn't say anything today, I'd say this. Be faithful here. Because if you're faithful here, to the best of your ability, the Bible says God will reward you. And what will God reward you with? I mean, there's some things that are, are uh, some that are very simple, not very de well defined about rewards, okay? But expand your imagination to evaluate God's creation. Does God need help running his universe? No, he doesn't need help. But will he share his universe he may, re he may blow the whole thing up and start all over again. That's what some scripture says, right? But if God wanted to, and he wanted to expand his family. See, you and I think, you know, back, back when I was growing up, you know, four, five, and six kids was a big family. Now, in the modern times, one, two, three is a big family. But God doesn't think like that. God thinks in billions and zillions and trillions. And so if... We all are gathered together, which the Bible says we will be. That's what the rapture is called, the gathering of the saints. The church, the body of Christ, will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. Well, so, you know, I think in terms of eternity is a really long time, and, and other people go, well, eternity is, you know, not, you don't measure eternity by time, but I'm kind of natural thinking along those lines. And so I realized that, you know, what does God want to do? What does God want to do for eternity? And the simple answer for me personally is a big family, bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Because if you put the enemy in the, in the bottomless pit and all the angels that sinned with the devil and they're bound and chained in the bottomless pit, and unfortunately, people that didn't accept Christ are now in hell. Then you've got all the saints with God and his angels. And 
eternity ahead for believers. As Pastor Mac always said, not to sip, sit on a cloud and sip papaya juice, <laughs> but to do something, to be effective, to be useful, to use the rewards that are given to you by God. What is the point of going to heaven and getting rewards if they're not useful in eternity future? And so I encourage someone to begin to think in those terms. As, as we grow in age, I mean, some of you are young. Some of you are just beginning your career. Some of you are, are, uh, are just, just starting out in life. You're building, you're building, you're building. Maybe you're building a family. Maybe you're building a career. Maybe you're building a, a car in your garage, whatever it is. But you, you're thinking in, in, in times now. But, but others were thinking in different terms. And so I think ahead what is the purpose of the incredible expanse of the universe? And so I, I look forward to ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Now we know that the Bible says that Jesus Christ, after the rapture, will go back for the marriage supper of the Lamb, spend seven years in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we'll all come back uh, with Jesus Christ at the end of that seven years, and Jesus Christ will set himself down on the Mount of Olives, and then he will, uh, with the breath, I say this, I say this, with his breath, whew, whatever mess was made on the earth, all Jesus has to do is breathe and the breath of his life will change the atmosphere, will change the destruction of the earth that the enemy did in the book of Revelation, change the radioactivity, change the, uh, all the horrors of, of, of the, uh, the ruined earth and he'll fix it in a, in a blink of an eye with a word, with a breath of life and it'll be turned back into the paradise that it was intended to be and will go into the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. But after that is the eternal age, and in that eternal age, I like to sp uh, speculate. May I speculate? Would you be offended if I speculated? I'm not going to tell you about my speculation, but I'm going to tell you I do speculate. I do think. I think past the thousand years. I think out into the eternal age. Is God going to bring the whole universe back into one and then begin to expand again into something different or what is God going to do? I like to think like that. He's given the word of God in different places in the Bible that create these thought patterns which I like to think about when I kick back and meditate on the greatness and the power of God. The power of God is something that we need to meditate on so that you fully, fully give God glory and credit for his power. So that when you come up a sit against a situation that seems like there's no solution, there's no way to solve the problem, there's no way to get out of the mess, God is so big, the universe is so big that your problem is minuscule that God could solve it with just one single word from God could change everything in your life. Uh, somebody said, I think man, it might be Joyce Weir, one, Joyce Meyer, somebody said, one word from God can change your entire life. So we need to have faith, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So I'm building my faith. I'm staying in the New Testament. I'm staying in the letters that Paul wrote. I'm staying in, in, in Jesus' uh, Jesus' words. I'm going to Proverbs and Psalms. And yes, of course, we learn and study the Old Testament, but our New Testament place is in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is the one that explained so much about where we're going and what we're going to do. And he said, again, and I said this probably twice or three times, the Lord shall descend from heaven heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet, da -da 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 -da, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They're not there. Their bodies are there. Their bodies aren't even there. Their DNA is there. Their DNA will rise, and the spirit that comes with Jesus will join that DNA in the air and they'll receive glorified bodies. You and I that are alive and remain will be changed in the twinkling of an eye that quickly. I'm changed from corruption to incorruption. I'm changed from mortal to immortal. I'm changed into an eternal body. 
I get to go. You get to go. We get to go. And there's been, you know, back in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 20s, there's been movies. Everybody's probably seen a movie about the rapture. This church, we believe it. Why? Here's why. Because it says it. God tells it to us. It is written. And we'll just look at, for a couple more minutes, we'll look at some of these things. In Luke 21, 36, what, what's on the screen right now? Oh, good. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy. All right, so how am I counted worthy? Oh, if you knew me, man, you know I'm not worthy. Are you a Christian? Yes. Say yes. yes. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Yes. yes. Are you bought with the price? Yes. Then you get to go. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. You are included. It's not based on you. It's based on him. It's based on his grace. It's based on his favor. It's based on his life. You have the life of God in you no matter what. I mean, Christians, you know, we don't really want to go there. But, I mean, obviously there's going to be some people in the wrong place at the wrong time when Christ comes back and they're Christians. In the wrong place at the wrong time. Christians. That's why I want to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. I want to be reading my Bible or praying or, or just being in joyful celebration of the goodness of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God. But obviously, out of the millions and millions of Christians, there's going to be many that are in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't want to be ashamed. Even if you're ashamed, even if you're crying because you're ashamed, God will wipe away every tear. God will wipe away all the tears from your eyes. The secret, though, is don't be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Change. All right, so going on, uh, Luke 21, 28. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption. Irredemption is drawing near. Redemption is found nine times in the Old Testament, 11 times in the New Testament. It's release, deliverance, liberation. Rosh Hashanah every year is a sign of the times. Every believer should be aware of it. Rosh Hashanah is the Feast of the Trumpets, the Jewish New Year, sign of the times. Many believers believe that the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets is the catching away of the church. Well, you know, if, if God said we don't know that if the Bible says we, we don't know the, the day or the hour, then why would you think that the Feast of Trumpets is the catching away of the church? Because some of these feasts go more than one day, and so you don't know the day. And if you don't know the day, you don't know the hour. If you don't know the hour, you don't know the minute. You don't know the second. You don't know the millisecond. You don't know the twinkling of an eye is incredibly fast according to second. The, uh, here it is right here. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, the Apostle Paul says, Behold, I'm telling you a secret. The mystery there is mysterion is a secret. I'm telling you a secret. Uh, the Greek word is 3466 in your New Testament uh, concordance. It's a hidden thing, a secret, a mystery, generally mysteries, religious secrets confided. Listen to this. This is what this says confided only to the initiated and not to ordinary mortals. You're not an ordinary mortal. You are a supernatural believer in Jesus Christ right now because you have eternal life living on the inside of you. And so if we accept the truth of that matter, that the greater one, the Holy Spirit, the third person, the divine Godhead, lives on the inside of me, and that the old Steve has passed away, behold, all things have become new with Steve, therefore I have some, uh, I have ability, I have a super natural access to the things of God. If we think like that, if, we, if, you, if you're facing a situation in your marriage, if you're facing a situation, 
situation in your children, if you're facing a situation in your job, if you're facing a situation in life, in any circumstance, any trial, tribulation, anything you're going through, recognizing that you have the mind of Christ and you have uh, the greater one, the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, that you can tap the, the avenues of God's wisdom. Read the, the second chapter, the first and second chapters of 1 Corinthians. The Bible says that the Spirit goes out and it, it searches the avenues of God's wisdom and you have access to that wisdom. So there's no mountain that you can't climb. There's no valley that you can't come out of. There's no uh, sin that you can't break free of. There's no trouble or, or uh, difficulty that you're in that you can't get out of. That if you trust the Lord with all your heart and you'll lean not to your own understanding in all your ways if you'll acknowledge him, he will direct you out of it. You can get out of the problem you're in. You can get out if you'll just be a doer of the word and you'll seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. We believe that God will help us. We believe that I'm not in this world on my own. I'm not just trudging through like, I, like I'm a, uh, what, 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 what kind of skier is that that they just shovel along? What? cross-country skier. I'm not a cross-country skier in life, and I'm always just pushing and propelling my own self. I'm not propelling myself. You're not propelling yourself. You've got the supernatural ability of God on the inside of you. You've got the power of God resident in your spirit. The old you died. Your new capacity was changed into the ability to have God live in you. I am God inside minded. I can do all things through Christ. If that was, is it true or not? Somebody, everybody say amen. amen. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, who strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Everything I put my hands to prospers because God is in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we begin to walk that direction. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. Nobody doesn't make mistakes. Nobody doesn't fail. The best person I know in my life is Pastor Nancy. And she even yells at me once in a while too. So, I mean, <laughs> she's not perfect. So... But the idea is that God Almighty came to live in my spirit, your spirit, mine. And now, as the Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Wow, that's good. I love that. All right, so again... 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump or trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Uh, again, Christ will descend from heaven at the rapture to take the church back. The second coming of Christ to earth seven years later at the end of the tribulation. Everybody say, I won't be here. Praise God, what good news. You can walk out of here going, hey, it's not based, I, you know, I might have kicked the dog before I left or I might have uh, taken something that belongs to Pastor Nancy or, or done something wrong, but it's not based on your goodness or non-goodness. It's based on your faith that Jesus Christ saved you and you're going to go with them at that time trumpet call. You're going to go in the rapture. Now, obviously, if you don't know if you're a Christian, that's dangerous territory. I don't want to be left behind because I was wavering in my decision. Do I want to be known as a Christian? Hey, if you're ashamed, of God, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and then to the Greek. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel. If you're ashamed, we got to get over that. I remember when I, I remember when I got over it. 16 years old when I got over it. Now, in my 20s, there was a gap. Sorry. But it, when I was 16, I said, man, I believe this. I believe what I'm preaching. 16, I believe what I'm preaching. And I want to be saved. You need to tell somebody. 
hmm, who can I tell? So I was a 16-year-old. I got on the city bus, and I'm going, I'm going to tell somebody. And I look up on a city bus, and it's full of my buddies from school. <laughs> my eyes just freaked out. I went, oh, God, not this. <laughs> I could have I shrunk back and said, I'm not doing it. How many times do you shrink back from God and say, I'm not doing what you're telling me, God? And then you repent and you move on. I mean, somebody right now, that something's going on in you and you're going, I'm not doing it, God. And you know what? God just moves on and, and you, you need to just say, God, I repent of being disobedient and you need to start saying yes instead of no. That's what that's what's Christianity. It's, it's really basic. Your next step, yes or no. I say yes or I say no. If I say no, then I need to ask God, God, I'm sorry, Lord, I said no. I didn't want to do what you told me. I missed it. Uh, you just need to get right with God. But you say yes, and you start moving forward, and you start walking, and, 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 and you begin to gain momentum. You begin to gain strength. The strength comes from the Word. The Word builds it up in you. The Spirit's in you. And all of a sudden, you get some momentum going, and then all of a sudden, you get tested. And sometimes we fail. Get up. Wipe yourself off. Get going again. Father, see, now here's where I might be different than most of you. If I fail, when I know what's right, I admit my sin. And he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me of unrighteousness. The Apostle John said, if we admit our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of unrighteousness. You know, there's a whole debate about that verse. There's just, it's just too big of a debate. But if you take it in simplicity and you know you're wrong or you know you disobey God, or you know you told God no. We've all told God no. How many times do we say no to God? Some of us say, no, I never do. I, I do everything God tells me. I, I love you, man. You're, you're, I love you, man. You're really a good Christian. But many things, we get prompted. Promptings. The Holy Spirit. The eighth, eighth chapter of Romans. Promptings. The witness of the Spirit nudges, nudging you to do what's right, nudging you to tell the truth, nudging you to live your life. It's, it's challenging. So anyways, I went, I'm, I'm on that bus, city bus, and I get on the bus, and uh, I'm breaking the ice here, man. I'm going to tell somebody I'm a Christian. <laughs> and my, my buddies from school are there. I'm like, oh, no, I'm getting off the bus. I don't want to do this. But you know what? Sometimes this may not seem, and some of you would never take yourself by the ear. That means take yourself there and do it. See, I didn't physically take myself by the ear, but spiritually I took myself by the ear and I went back there and I knew what they were going to say. Yo, Steve, what's up? And the best I could do is, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I'm now Jesus. I'm a, I'm a Christian now, and I go to church, and I believe in God. I machine gutted those words out. They looked at each other, and they went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't because they're, they're standoff, standoffers because I was a Christian. No, they're standoffers because of the way I presented it. But you've got to break the ice some way. And pretty soon it got easier and easier, and pretty soon now you're telling people, yeah, I believe in, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and he changed my life, and now that he changed my life, I'm able to share the truth of the gospel with others, and if you're interested in hearing me tell a little bit about my life, I could share some things with you that I overcame some obstacles in my life and, and some fears and doubts and, and pains and sufferings that are uh, part of my consistent pattern of my life have been broken by the power of the Spirit of God and now I want to just testify that there's power in the Word and that Jesus Christ saved my life and now I'm a Christian and I know that if I died right now I'd go to heaven so if you died right now would you go to heaven? 
So you come from being terrified to tell anybody you're a Christian all of a sudden to being pretty smooth because you practice, because you do it. You tell somebody you're a Christian. And so, um, so it says here that at the, se- at the end of the seven years of the tribulation, that Jesus Christ will come back to the earth and the Bible says he'll set up his thousand-year millennial kingdom on the earth. And I'm going to probably wrap this up right now in a moment here. And that's called the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you guys know this, but for someone young that, that they haven't put the pieces together yet, I remember when the pieces didn't fit. But the more you do your research, the more you're diligent, and the more you, you listen to the word of God, the pieces begin to fit really nicely. They fit perfect. Because God's perfect. And you just let God show you pieces and, and they, they come together. All right, so then uh, the thousand-year reign of Jesus on earth is called the millennium. And then uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, we talked about that. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That obviously is, a, is another holiday that's going to be celebrated in the book, uh, the book in the month of, of September. And lastly, let's just look at a couple of things as we close here. I want to just touch on both of these. In Luke chapter 21, verse 25, Jesus was telling the people that were around him, there will be signs in the sun, signs in the moon, signs in the stars, and there will be on earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the roar, waves roaring, people's hearts failing them for fear. And, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Uh, Jesus also said that there's going to be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and sky. Well, there's just an amazing amount of chatter about what's going on in the sun, the moon, the stars, and in the sky and we need to consider that it's part of what Jesus told us about. And it goes on in uh, Luke 21. It says, distress of nations with perplexity. Things are going to get so confused and so challenging that nations will be in distress because of the perplexity of the problems they're facing. It says, the oceans and the seas will become more violent. And people's hearts will fail them for, because they're living in fear of things that are coming on the earth. So you and I, one of the greatest victories of our Christianity is we've been delivered from fear. God has not given... This is one of your first top 10 verses. God has not given us a spirit of fear. But let's say it. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we don't have to be afraid of things we see in the sun, the stars, the moon, the sky. We don't have to be afraid of the things that are happening on the earth. We don't have to uh, be afraid of perplexity of nations and a quandary of not knowing how to solve problems. Hey, we're getting to a place on earth in this nation where the problems are mounting to the place where uh, Jesus said it's going to happen. The only solution is that he knows all the answers. We present the only solution. Humans don't say that. They don't say, well, Jesus is the only solution. No, they say, we can figure this out. And that's the problem from the beginning with man. We don't need Jesus. We can figure this out. So I'm going to probably close right there because I want to ask everyone in this room and those of you watching, if you're the type of person that says, I don't need Jesus, I can figure this out. Or if you're a Christian and you say, I don't need to pray about it because I can figure this out. That's a prideful attitude. And God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so what I want to suggest right now is that somebody in the room or somebody watching, just on purpose, even if you think in your mind, If I think hard enough and I'm diligent enough, I can figure this out. Well, praise God, you're you're, you're a really intelligent human being. But to let go and let God, to humble yourself and to say, Lord, I need your help. And you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. He will show you things 
No, this is King James, that you know not of. He'll speak to you. You'll hear the voice of the good shepherd and hear, and the voice of a stranger you'll not follow. We believe this. We're offering it to anyone that's in the room today. As we close the message, we invite someone at home. I'm looking, spending my time looking at you guys in the camera, but I'm looking at all of my friends and brothers and sisters in the room. And someone has reached the end of their rope, and you're going, what do I do now? Maybe the problems have mounted. Maybe the, maybe the bills have mounted. Maybe the physical, physical ailments have mounted, whatever the circumstances may be in this life. We surrender all. I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. So today may be a day for you to, to surrender your, your, your will. You know, praise God, some people are just incredibly strong-willed. That can be great, or it can be a detriment to you. Our, our call and our plea is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're not a brother and sister in Christ, to surrender today. Today is the day of salvation. And if you're a brother or sister in Christ, that you surrender your will and start letting God lead you by his spirit, by dependence and study and research and listening to the Holy Spirit for guidance. So I'm going to ask us to say the salvation prayer, and it could be, it could be refreshingly new for those of you that have said it a thousand times, but for someone today who may be saying it for the first time with sincerity, you can say this prayer and receive guidance, direction, and help from heaven above. Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for me. And was raised again from the dead so that I could have eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior and be my Lord. To the best of my ability, I want to serve you. God, I ask you, help me to figure it out. Help me to know the way. Help me to make the right decision. I'm asking you to guide me. I believe in you now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm so glad that God gives us his word so we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to try and figure everything out. We shouldn't be so shocked. I mean, when you think about it, it is kind of shocking, all the crazy stuff that is going on in the world, right? But in the end, God's in control. And if he's our Savior and he's our Lord, then he's got us. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, God has not appointed us to wrath. So we might live in the world, but we are not of the world. And seriously, as a Christian, what's the worst thing that could happen to you? You go to heaven? That's a win. Stop worrying about it. And just ask God, what's your role right now? Do you realize that everybody in this book wondered who we were going to be? The angels wondered what kind of people are going to be in the earth when Jesus is ready to come back for the church. And he picked us. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to let our light shine. It's a privilege to know who we are in Christ. It's a privilege. Sometimes we just have to adjust how we're looking at it. Stop being so worried. God's got you. We still have Bibles in this country. If you need a real Bible, please take one. They're free in the back. If there's things going on in your life, there's a ton of books on the bookcase. They're free for anybody that wants to take one. If you need help, there's help available. 
we'll pray for you, Pastor Steve and I'll be here after church. If you need prayer for anything, come forward. Don't be, don't be shy. We've been in the ministry downtown a long time. So first of all, we've heard everything. There's not, <laughs> trust me, there's not one thing going on in your life that we haven't already heard. God loves you. He wants to help you. He wants your life to be better. And he wants you to be a part of the living church that helps to let people know about his goodness in this time. Because there's a lot of people pointing the finger at God, not understanding who the real enemy is. It's not God. And just for clarification, Pastor Steve used the phrase, you know, kick the dog and whatever. That's an old school phrase. We do not kick our dog. <laughs> Pastor Steve has never kicked the dog. He loves his dog. But, you know, just in case somebody, like, thinks that that, whatever, because he said it. <laughs> never kicks a dog. Sometimes he tells Caesar to quit looking at him when he's eating a hamburger, you know. But other than that, we love our dog. All right. Anyway, Pastor Steve and I just, we will say this from time to time, because Pastor Steve and I, he will never tell me what he's going to minister on. He's ne he never tells me what he's going to say, so I don't even ask him. And a lot of times when we come to church, the music, the ministry during the music, and then what he says, you would think that we sat down with each other and totally planned it out. We don't plan anything out. We trust the Holy Spirit. He trusts the Holy Spirit, leads him with the things that he ministers on to us as a church. I trust the Holy Spirit. Brian trusts the Holy Spirit. And so we just all show up. And we trust the Holy Spirit's got a plan. And guess what he does? So you're not going to believe the scriptures that I have for the offering today. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, <laughs> verse 7. We're going to start in verse 7. Uh, Let each one give as he has made up his own mind and purposed in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves, he takes pleasure in, prizes above other things, and is unwilling to abandon or do without, a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver, whose heart is in his giving. Now, Pastor Steve quoted verse 8. God is able to make all grace and sufficiency abound, but I'm going to skip that verse, and I'm just going to jump up to verse 10. God, who provides seed for the sower, that's us, and bread for eating. So God is interested in us giving, but he's also interested in taking care of us. So he gives us the seed to sow, but he also provides the bread, the necessary things that we need in our life. And he will multiply our resources for sowing, and increase the fruits of our righteousness, which manifests itself in active goodness, kindness, and charity. Verse 11, thus you will be enriched in all things and in every way, so that you can be generous, and your generosity, as it administered by us, will bring forth thanksgiving to God. God's in the multiplication business. He's really in the multiplication business of saints, right? And as we begin to put the things of God into practice in our life, then our lives begin to amplify, amplify and glorify God. And the transformation of the old person, we become increasingly more transformed into the image of Jesus. God is interested in helping us, and his path for that is through giving and supporting the church. And we don't look, Pastor Steve and I don't look. John handles the the finances, and other people in the church. So we can stand up here with a clear conscience and just tell you what the truth of God's word is and give you an opportunity to participate in kingdom finances and God's way of doing things. If you're a guest, you're under no compulsion. If this is your church, then that's just part of being a Christian. Jesus said, money is the least of things to be faithful in. So start where you're at. Amen? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to sow in the offering today, to give. And Lord, I thank you that you do make all grace abound towards each one of us. You do supply seed for us to sow and bread to eat. And you multiply those resources sown, and you increase the fruit of our righteousness. There's fruit that is accounted to us when we just step out in obedience. And I'm thankful and grateful. Father, we purpose to use these offerings to further your work. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Well, John will be in the back to receive your offering. If you're giving here, if you're giving online, that just needs to be done. Threedegreeschurch.com. Uh, Pastor Steve's men's group, even though it's a holiday weekend, uh, Saturday at 9 o'clock here at the church. Guys, you are welcome to join. There's coffee and orange juice and rolls and a good discussion. And uh, we will see you either Wednesday night at 7 or men Saturday morning at 9 and then back here next Sunday. Have a great week.